Hello to everyone, Miss Coffee Bean here. Finally, Letizia has found some time to animate me and give me my voice back. I missed being out here with you guys. Today we are going to talk about peer review in NLP, something that Letizia has been busy with during the last few days. And in this video, we will be presenting this awesome paper by Anna Rogers and Isabel Augenstein. It is a short paper accepted at EMNLP findings this year. It discusses how to improve peer review, a topic that could change the world. Well, could peer review really change the world? <laughs> yeah, why not? Think about one of the main chains of ideas. Research with new ideas coming not only from academia but also from industry should be spread to others. One way to do this is through publications. What ideas are valuable and impactful enough to be published is determined by peer review, where other scientists get to say how much they like the research and how much not. After publications, the ideas can be taken on by others for improvement, for further spreading or integration into super cool machine learning applications, right? But how to do the application part properly if the first part of the chain is flawed? Because, surprise surprise, peer review is broken. If we want to know how to fix it, we also want to know how it is broken, so it is time to look at this paper. Even though the paper is about the natural language processing field, we think that the general message can be useful for any kind of peer review. So let's see. The paper really does not mess around and starts abruptly with harsh claims like peer review does not guarantee quality control. Ouch. But no matter how much this sentence hurts, we cannot but agree to what they argue. Peer review is meant to guarantee that what is written in the paper is correct and high quality. But this is an impossible task because the papers are not reproducible, especially when thinking about the poor reviewers with limited time and unpaid review work. Then the authors say that peer review fails to detect impactful papers. Again, very harsh, but quite true. Important for paper impact is often not only the science itself, but other factors like the topic, the promotion on, for example, the social media, or how easy it is to take an idea and build on it further. Look at, for example, BERT or Transformers. Okay, so surprise, surprise, peer review is hard and ill-defined. So the authors ask what could peer review realistically do? Well, it could filter out obvious flaws and turn the spotlight onto quality, right? <laughs> but the problem is that we are not doing that. Oh. Instead, we are selecting or trying to select the best X percent of the papers and accept them. What could possibly go wrong hereby? <laughs> ah, uh, yes, we do not know where and how to draw the line. The idea that Miss Coffee Bean appreciated the most out of this paper is represented in this figure. Reviewing is like comparing apples with oranges. Different papers have different strengths. One has better methodology, the other one has better evaluation. Or should we select the idea but not so much its implementation? Or what should we focus actually on? Oh, I don't know how to judge this. I'm not, not an expert really my specialty. <laughs> so while Miss Coffee Bean really is having a mental topic, breakdown, I'm... I can tell you that the other thing that I liked most about this paper is the idea that reviewers choose different ways of coping with this impossible task that is required from them. So, Miss Coffee Bean, now that you recovered from your breakdown, what are the coping mechanisms? Ah, writing style. It is hard to resist the temptation to think that if there are language errors in the paper, the science is bad too. But this thinking is so wrong. Non-native English speakers can produce awesome science too. 
Well, the next way to cope with the impossible reviewing task is to look at only one table in the paper, you know, the one containing the result. If the proposed contribution is not the best there, we reject. We want only state of the art, right? <laughs> you know, but this ignores many things like efficiency, interpretability, all the other goodies beyond a high score in the evaluation metrics. Niche topics like, you know, everything that is not transformer or is not, I cite the paper, scientifically sexy <laughs> is so hard to publish. Especially in natural language processing, it is easy to publish work on English language, but it is hard on others, as if findings on other languages are not as generalizable as the findings on English. <laughs> To this wall of shame, the authors further add a problem widespread in the whole machine learning area, like already famous work where researchers publish already on archive, so the anonymous peer review is not so anonymous in the end. Also, big labs, which invest a lot of work into public relations, are famous and they get even more famous. In my observation, the big labs are even more recognizable in review just by, you know, compute resources or even plotting styles. So let's move on to the next coping mechanism. We sometimes tend to shame two simple solutions, because simple means it is easier, right? Nope, it's not. Overcomplication is easier than simplicity. Another way of coping is through spotlighting mainstream approaches like deep learning. But no, deep learning is not the answer to everything and other methods have their merit too. And especially in the big data requirements of deep learning, it is quite unintuitive why we do not appreciate resource papers so much. So okay, we're almost at the end of the wall of shame. <laughs> Novel approaches are too often rejected. This sounds absurd, yes, and the authors explain it through the human way of saying no to new stuff, because it is hard to comprehend, especially at first. And the last, and I think by far the worst entry of the wall of shame, are substitute questions that reviewers tend to ask in the impossible situations of assessing quality. If I did this study, would I have made the same choices? And in our opinion, this is the worst coping mechanism because it is the most subjective one and has to do a lot with the different backgrounds and personal ways of thinking of reviewers. I mean, the other coping mechanisms are at least expected and easy to counter, but this last point about the substitute questions is as varied as there are reviewers. For example, if you write a paper and test your model on dataset X and dataset Y, the reviewer says or asks, but why did you not test on dataset Z? The reviewer might actually mean, if I did this study, I would have tested on Z. And the problem with this question is that it is hard to say if the reason for having dataset Z is really scientific or just, you know, personal. So uh, anyway, while looking at this wall of shame, one might come up with the idea just to abolish peer review. But we remind about what we discussed at the beginning of this video, where we need to have a filter for publications for non-experts so they know what's quality and what's not. So what to do? The authors of the paper propose that reviewer work should be more valued and the working hours taken into account by employers. Review work should really not be done by overworked people in their spare time. And then they propose some ways to reduce the uncertainty that comes with the poor task definition of reviewing. For example, more organization energy should be invested into reviewer matching for assigning competent reviewers for each research topic. Then the review task should be more fine-grained to capture the diversity of papers and also the review forms should be able to capture this. 
announcing the conference or journal priorities before submission and reviewers giving not an overall score but specific scores that are weighted differently depending on these editorial priorities should also improve the definition of the task of peer review. And the reviewers faced with a well-defined task would be then relying less on coping mechanisms. Okay, so when do we do this? Many others had the ideas presented in this paper. And what I really appreciate most is that the authors managed to remind hereby everybody again about the peer review problems. So maybe this wake up call will finally have some effect. Miss Coffee Bean wanted to spread the word further with this video. If you want to help too, share this video with anybody interested or share the paper. You can find the link to the paper in the description below. See you next time. Okay, bye.